read from verse 2 to verse 9, Ecclesiastes 8, verses 2 to 9. <clears throat> I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. And the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurts. Ecclesiastes is uh, written by someone in their latter years of life. Uh, there is some discussion among scholars as to who the author is. I'm quite happy to accept that it is Solomon himself uh, and that he is addressing the people, not as their king, but as a preacher and as someone who has learned from bitter experience that living life from an under the sun perspective, an earth bound perspective, living life without reference to God, not living life with God, not living life for God, but seeking to uh, live life independently of the Almighty, that that way of life is empty, it's meaningless. And Solomon is saying to the people, don't do as I did. Don't turn away from the Lord as I did, but serve him. And know the wisdom that comes from fellowship with the Almighty. The wisdom that enables you to honor God day by day, but also the wisdom that brings to you the joy of a meaningful life and a life of purpose according to God's will. Now, as we come to these particular verses, Solomon is relating what he's been saying to the powers that be. Now, of course, in his case, he was the power. He was the king. But he's talking about how those who live with God and live for God interact with those in authority. Now, one characteristic of our age is a lack of respect for those in authority. In family life, children do not respect their parents. At school, teachers are disobeyed, sworn at, even physically assaulted. Politicians are treated with contempt. And the police, they're not feared, but subject to ridicule. You can watch these programs on the television that follow uh, police as they go about their duties. And it's quite striking how those that they engage with are often 
dismissive of them uh, and very rude and very discourteous to the police. And we perhaps remember that in the day of the judges, there was a similar problem in Israel. And we are told everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But a reason is given for this breakdown of respect and order. We're told in those days there was no king in Israel. There was no authority figure. But I'd like to suggest that things are even worse in our day than they were in the time of the judges, because there is law and order in our land. Yet people deliberately refuse to acknowledge and respect authority. Individualism is rapidly spreading through our society, threatening to engulf us in the anarchy that it produces. And in a world where the true wisdom of fellowship with God is replaced by the folly of human independence, then anarchy is inevitable. And Solomon addresses this in these verses. First of all, let's look together at verses 2 to the first part of verse 5. And Solomon is simply saying in these verses, obey the king. Have respect for the king which will lead to three actions that are equally applicable to a modern democracy. First of all, keep the king's commands, obedience to the king, or in our case, uh, society today, obedience to the laws of the land. Second, loyalty to the king. Do not be hasty to go from his presence, we read in the first part of verse 3. Uh, it was a mark of disloyalty, of disrespect, to absent yourself from the king's presence. It was a sort of statement of a rebellious nature to walk out on the king. Well, in our case, we would say that there should be a respectful loyalty to the nation and institutions of the state. And then the third <coughs> thing Solomon highlights in the second part of verse 3 to the opening part of verse 5 is not provoking unnecessarily the king's displeasure. Perhaps we would word it more in terms of not seeking confrontation and conflict with the powers that be not being needlessly provocative and aggressive and seeking to undermine those authorities <coughs> that God has put over us in society. And Solomon's reason for requiring these three things is that it is a part of our duty to God in the ESV, as I read, verse 2 says, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Other translations have because of your oath to God. And the idea is, whichever way you read it, 
that the relationship between authority, the people in authority and those who are under that authority is a God-ordained relationship. And to not observe that is not merely to be rebellious against the government, against a king, against an emperor, but it's to be rebellious against the sovereign Lord who has ordained all things. The relationship between <coughs> government and those governed is part of God's plan for the ordering of society, for the good of its members. It's part of God's common grace, of God's purpose to do good to all men, even those who are rebels against him, even those who have not bowed the knee to the lordship of Christ. God, in his love and goodness, yet designs things, designs the pattern of life for their good, and that includes putting in authority those who would restrain evil and promote justice. God has established this relationship between governments and those governed for the good of mankind as a whole and indeed for his own glory. And we read that in Romans 13 earlier in our service. And in Romans 13, the refusal to respect authority is clearly seen as rebellion against God, who in his wisdom appointed those authorities. And so if we turn to 1 Peter 2 and verse 17, there is a command there. And the command has two parts. First, fear God. Second, honor the king. And they appear to be two sides of the same coin. In order to fear God, you must also honor the king. The source of decline in respect for authority found in our land stems from our society's rejection of God. Without a fear of God, there can be no right and no wrong. If we are not answerable to the Almighty, then we are answerable to no one. Where there is no God, no absolutes exist. Relativism rules. And that means that people can do whatever they like as long as they can get away with it. And in such a world, evil becomes good and good is seen as evil. And the only sin becomes getting caught in doing something wrong. In such a godless age, moral anarchy and social breakdown are inevitable. And the consequences blight the lives of people. Often drawn to Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Those who turn everything on its head. And we are living in such a day when those things that God calls good are now described as evil. And those things that God has declared to be evil are celebrated 
as good. We are truly living in a godless age. And the only hope is that God in his mercy would draw us back to himself as a nation. And that by his grace, he would save us from the insanity of our self-inflicted wounds. We desire that God in his mercy would visit Wales again, that he would come in his grace and power, and bring people under conviction of sin and convince them of their need of the righteousness that is found in Christ alone, and that he would graciously draw people to repentance and faith in the Savior for the forgiveness of their sins. Oh, the need of the hour is for God to come again. But we have a responsibility as believers to reach out into the decaying society around us, to reach out with the gospel. The truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the only answer to man's true need of being restored to a right relationship with God. And we should pray without ceasing for God to come again to our land in revival, as he has done in the past. At times that were equally godless, at times that were equally dark, he had mercy and he visited us and did a great and mighty thing. And we should be in prayer, asking that he would do so again, even as we seek also his enabling power to fulfill our calling to preach Christ into a lost world. Obey the king. But as we move on in these verses from the second part of verse 5 through to verse 7, Solomon also speaks of no blind obedience. If there's a great danger of a lack of respect for authority. Well, there's a counter danger, another extreme, where unquestioning allegiance can be given to a king or a government. And so giving to man that which God alone deserves, the surrenders, the surrender of our lives, in his service. Perhaps the most extreme example in our day is that of North Korea, where people, well, it's a cult, it's, it's a personality cult. It has very strong religious overtones, the way in which the Kim family are worshipped and described uh, almost well, godlike qualities. And you have to unquestioningly obey the regime. Well, that's an extreme example. But wherever man's laws clash with God's law, then we are conscious bound to follow the latter. Our obedience to the powers that be is secondary to our obedience to God. And that can sometimes place us as believers in a difficult position. It may even lead to us facing real persecution. How, how are we to respond in those 
difficult situations in our place of work, in our civic lives as individuals and as a corporate body, a church, where there is a pressure or there are demands that are made which are contrary to God's will. What advice does Solomon bring to us? Well, in such circumstances, he directs us to seek the wisdom that God alone can provide, the wisdom to discern what to do and how to do it when the time is ripe. The second part of verse 5, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. By that abiding relationship with God in Christ, we know the wisdom of God's word, and we know the leading of the Holy Spirit. Solomon says in verse 6 that in such situations, our miseries might increase. We might be under tremendous pressure. We might find ourselves buckling under the demands. But he says we should not be impatient. We shouldn't react in haste. Verse 6, for there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavily on him. Rather, we entrust ourselves to the care of our Heavenly Father. Solomon says in verse 7, we, we don't know what the future is going to bring. We don't know whether the way we respond will uh, lead to a solution or perhaps might even lead to the situation getting worse. But God does. For he does not know what it is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? We don't know how it will work out, but we know that our Heavenly Father orders all things for good to those who love him. We place our confidence in the Lord, in the sure knowledge that it is well with our souls. The believer is not a revolutionary hothead who lashes out at the injustices of godless governments and of a decaying society. The believer does not conform to the ways of the world. He steadfastly determines to oppose all that is contrary to God's will, but he seeks to do so with both the wisdom and the winsomeness of the Savior. Think of the example of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they were carried off into the exile in Babylon, and they were to be uh, trained to become part of the establishment, the civil service, and that required them to do certain things. And in chapter one, we're told their names were changed from names that had reference to Yahweh, to names that had reference to Babylonian gods. And we're told that they were to eat food from the king's table, food that would have been part of the religious life through sacrifices of the land. And these are challenges to them, but how, how wise they were. The wisdom given to them as young boys, probably teenagers, and how they are able to suggest to the chief eunuch that they are excused from the food and given a much more basic uh, menu, and that uh, they were to be examined, to, to be seen if there was any detrimental effect 
from them not eating the food at the king's table. And of course, when they are examined, it's found that far from their abilities being diminished, the opposite is true. How wise. Yet, later on, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are commanded to bow down to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar has set up, they, they, they will not budge an inch. They will not give in at all, even when they are threatened with death, even when Nebuchadnezzar says that the furnace will be heated up so hot that nobody could possibly survive and no God would be able to save them. Yet they stand resolutely firm against the king's command. And they say to him, even if we are not rescued, we want you to know, Nebuchadnezzar, we will never bow down. And of course, we know that God in his grace does rescue them. We are not called to a blind obedience to those in authority. Our first responsibility is to obey God. And that can bring us into situations of conflict with those in authority and society in general. And we need great wisdom when that happens. Christians have always fought for justice and freedoms in this world precisely because their first allegiance is to God and not man. They have opposed tyranny and the injustices that so often uh, mar uh, the life of people in our world. And they have done that because they serve the will of God in this world. And most of all, they have opposed the greatest tyrant of them all, Satan. They have flung themselves into the conflict with the disease of sin and the spiritual poverty it brings. And as believers in our day, we need to be active in the spiritual battle of prayer and the proclaiming of the word of God, and also in the practical more physical battles of our age where that spiritual warfare has a physical manifestation in the sort of areas I spoke of earlier, where bad laws are proposed and we're to do it, not simply because we fear that those laws will have a negative effect upon our lives, but because we know that they will damage society. We know that they do not honor God. And as we do that, we are to seek God for wisdom. We are to trust in God for his strengthening and equipping of us to meet the challenge that he would enable us to stand steadfast in the faith. We shouldn't be impetuous, we shouldn't be aggressive, but nevertheless, we should with determination testify to Christ. And whatever the adversity we might find ourselves in, to be faithful. The Lord will provide the wisdom and the strength we need. And then finally in verse 8, Solomon reminds us the limits to human authority. Even the most powerful king or government are limited to 
things show that. First of all, no human authority can control the spirit of another human being. No man has power to retain the spirit. Again, there are slightly different translations of that phrase in different versions. Uh, some like the ESV that I just quoted seem to uh, be referring more to uh, no man has the power to extend his life to retain uh, the spirit from being separated uh, from the body. Uh, other translations seem to emphasize more that uh, no human being has control over another human being's spirit. They can exercise power over a man's body, but they cannot do anything with his soul. There is a definite limit. And the second is that even the greatest of kings cannot escape the clutches of death or power over the day of death. Nobody defeats death. And the most powerful dictator will have to answer for his evil deeds and wicked actions. It is God's prerogative alone to dispose of the souls of men as he sees fit. And he alone is able to change the spiritual condition of men. It is God alone who appoints the day of a man's death, be that man a pauper or a king. And then it is God who brings judgment upon the sinner and avenges the wickedness of his life. And those who wield power in this world do so only until God's appointed time for judgment. Those dictators like Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, who killed and mutilated millions, would now rather die a million times over themselves than face the wrath of God, powerless to avoid eternal damnation. Solomon tells us that whether we rightfully respect and acknowledge the powers that be who exercise authority over us, whether they do so fairly or not, if we respect them, or perhaps we are compelled to oppose them because they have abused that power, we must always remember that ultimately true authority lies with God alone. I was interested to read uh, a few years ago somebody uh, speaking about the story of King Canute. All of us, I suspect, uh, uh, heard that story in our school days how the king was uh, being praised by his followers who <clears throat> said that even the waves would obey him and he's taken down to the seashore and put there at the edge of the waves in order to command them to stop coming in. And of course, his feet get wet. And uh, the person who was commenting on that story was saying, well, Perhaps what was happening was not that Canute was the proud man, but that he was the humble man and that he was trying to show that he did not have the authority to command the waves. And the suggestion coming from this person was that Canute was a believer. He was a Christian and that he was powerfully demonstrating that he did not have the final authority 
the authority that belongs to God alone. <coughs> there are limits to human authority. And so in Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus said, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. All people are answerable to God. He has ultimate authority. <coughs> In the day of judgment, no one will dare stand before him and dispute his authority. Those who have not come to faith in Christ and had their sins forgiven will be terrified before his mighty presence. Those who by his grace know Christ as their saviour will rejoice before his presence knowing <coughs> that their salvation has nothing to do with their own deeds, but all to do with Christ's sacrifice. As believers, we have a duty towards our country, towards our fellow man. We have a duty before those who are in authority, but those duties are only a part of our greater duty to God. His is the ultimate authority before which we bow. He is also our loving heavenly father who sent his only begotten son to die on the cross that we might be saved. And he is truly worthy of all honor and praise and the complete surrender of our lives in his service. So we must honor our king, the king of kings, the Lord of Lord, lords, Jesus Christ, our Savior, he deserves the obedience of our lives for his glory sake. And we desire to honor him in all that we do. And that means also honoring those that God has placed in authority. But the honor of those in authority does not mean that we do not oppose that which is wrong in God's eyes. We must stand up for the truth, for the good of society and for the glory of God. Knowing that all human authority has its limitations and we submit ourselves always to the sovereign rule and authority of God. So may we be encouraged to know the wisdom of that fellowship with God that Solomon uh, refers to in these verses as we live for God's glory in our present evil age for his name's sake amen let